you want to know where are all the the, uh, the predications, or where are all the abstracts that say aspirin treats headache, you can get that. But if you want to know what are all the different things that treat headache, you can also look at that. Yes, but we have if you look at the figures, and you say you have 21 million abstracts, and you only have 56 million predications, I know many of the older ones are empty. Or That's small. largely because, yeah. because up um, until they only have titles. Okay, so That's basically, basically because you would expect more than two or three yeah. uh, predicates. But that, that's the main reason, is that the, it, up until, I don't know when exactly, but maybe in even the 60s, probably, is, it's only recently that you can be assured that just about every citation has an abstract. Yeah, in the 40s and stuff, <coughs> and we, we actually go back to something up in 1910, uh, in, in the, it's all, all type, only titles. Let me ask now, but I was going to wait till the end, but no, no, and there's been, uh, I'm sorry, this is not my field, but uh, there's been in, uh, in computational linguistics, right? there's been uh, a trend to make sure we start with a syntactic approach. And then it turned out not to be as effective as people thought, and development of ontologies and that they uh, not, has also not turned out uh, much. The one of the issues is that uh, the contextual effects are really probabilistic. They give you your example of management, right? It could be administration, it could be a lot of other issues. So how do you, um, so what do you have here that, that is different from, from that? Well, that's, that's, since you, uh, yeah, since well, you that's, sort no, of no, very, no, no. No, statistical approaches. Yes, right. Because, I mean, not that they don't work pretty well, but it's just my point is they're in, entirely uninteresting because they're totally unrevealing about what's actually going on. So I, they're, they're, they're a perfectly good tool, but they're, they're completely uninteresting to me as a matter of, as a matter of, of, of computational linguistic research. But the reason that this works, and so the thing is, that's right, in the, in the 80s, essentially, uh, late 70s and 80s, I mean, it's, it's syntax, formal syntax, was the god of computational linguistics. Well, yeah, not only Chomsky, but in, yeah, yeah, that's exactly, yeah, Chomsky would sort of give me the linguistics, but in, uh, in, uh, um, in natural language processing, everyone used basically, you're right, kind of Chomsky methods, but they tried to give a complete syntactic analysis, which is, as I've said, is simply impossible. <laughs> simply impossible. So, as I said, I boy, I mean, the word about lots of things that are very rare, actually, in, in scientific discourse. I mean, whether you front to prep, you know, things like, so you start out with, I like beans, and then beans I like means the same thing, well, why, and why can't you say, I beans like, and I mean, they're worried about these kind of things that are actually not relevant to, to implementation, and they worried about, well, and, and if you want to even perform it, and, and other reasons why the system failed, because they didn't worry so much about what the actual facts were, or what we were really going to do with them, but what were the mathematical characteristics of, of this approach? Is this context sensitive? Is it only mildly context sensitive? And really, that again is totally irrelevant to to this approach, and they, they, and for the most part, they either then some people like uh, Terry Winograd did use some use an ontology for that. He had this box world sort of thing, but it was a toy world. <clears throat> it was a toy world, and so nobody cared about it. And the reason, and there's two reasons why I think they didn't move forward. Like, if, first of all, people they wanted to do interesting things mathematically, not practical. A practical result. And they also didn't want to, they wanted to do, if they were going to do anything, they wanted to do language linguistics, they didn't want to sit and construct huge ontologies of little details of, you know, and, and that sort of thing. They didn't want to do that. But I think the reason this is successful, and I have to say it is the one and really only successful system out there that can extract semantic predication from a large amount of text, is because it so pretty much boiled away syntax and it took advantage of the UMLS. And so the UMLS was built independently. And we took advantage. And then, in addition, we've added new, I mean, more sophisticated methods of um, of, uh, of, of word sense disambiguation. And in this case, you're right, management between lots of things. But if you see, this is the other thing: is if it has within its syntactic purview a drug and a disease, it must be treats. It has. It does not mean that I'm managing my but, research group. But it's still probabilistic, right? It's still it can be. Changed. No, well, I don't call it. Pro it's not probabilistic in the formal sense, though. Yeah. Uh, n well, you can predict in, in some cases which is more likely to have been said, but it's not mathematically probabilistic. It's not based on stochastic systems. But, but there is even a, a more philosophical part. Yes. Of it. And, and you know, my most cited quote is: "Text mining, why bury it first and then mine it again." All the work that Tom <laughs> just showed us is to have a hell of a job to find what this guy actually meant. And this is because we didn't have any other way. But in the future, we need to publish our original results, both in computer-readable and ambiguous format, and write narrative for people. So 
as you train the researchers to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. So, right. so, right. so you need a generative model, but, but yeah. at the same time, that doesn't mean that you. No, you well, this is incredibly useful. useful. But we only yeah. have to I mean, do it because we have been burying our language in text. Right. And, it's not, it's, and it's not that I'm, there's no, it's not that just, I mean, it's just, I mean, the wonderful discipline. I'm just, but I mean, the point is, for, <laughs> I mean, I'm rather against statistics. But I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, that isn't my good. point, but my point would be that, you know, it's, say, if you want, a language, if you want to make any progress, not only in practical results, but if you try and provide some insight into human cognition, which is there is a, quite a number of people that are, that are wanting to do that. I have a graduate student that, that is working now that is looking at this sort of thing. You need to look at some of the processes that probably, I mean, humans use, certainly you, you do use statistics and say, oh yeah, I've heard that before. But that's not all you all use. I mean, it's sort of, I don't think we don't just count in our mind. So we don't just count how many times it's occurred. We know that in an ontology, some things go together, and this is the way I view it. And this is what meaning is. I mean, as I put it, frequency of occurrence is an epiphenomenon of meaning. It's not the core aspect of it. I mean, it's just like if you're teaching someone to do something and say, okay, you know, in order to do this correctly, you put this here, then you put this here, then you put this there. And that's kind of the statistical approach in a language processing. They say, how much does this text look like this text? But if you want the person to really understand and say, well, the reason you put it here is because, or the reason you do this, which a statistical approach does not give right, you in, for it. In languages outside of your mouth and, and medical constraint, and the polysemic synonymy is going to kill you. No, 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 because we have methods, no, no, no. You have to have a context. No, no, well, of course. You have to have very, very strong context. Actually, no, but you have, sure, you have to know the context, but, I mean, that's, but humans do too, if, I mean, and, and, Absolutely, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's well, easier to do it for a specific you know, discipline than for absolutely. everything. No, no, but you have, if you are going to do, if you're going to extend this to, and we do, we actually do do this, you have to know ahead of time, and you can use just the method for that. You know, if you can do and there's nothing. Or you could be told, you could be told, in this ontology, this is economics, this is medicine. Use the economics vocabulary, right. use the medical vocabulary. So how do you decide you read Jaguar in a fix where it's the car or the animal, but right. it's context. So That's you, right. Oh yeah, well this uses... Otherwise you wouldn't know. Or bank, you know. Yeah, yeah, but this uses context ex extensively. It's right. just the context is defined by the ontology. But, but as, as you pointed out earlier, it seems to me, the reason for your success and the purest failure is it's a partial analysis. Yes, I think that's right. I think, I think that's not that you're not doing the perfect job. No, no, you're absolutely. The core, the right. core of the yeah. absolutely. It's a breadth first kind of rem and depth. And again, I think that's very common human thing. Very rarely, especially if you're, you're everybody's busy, but you sit down and read things literally all the way through and understand every solitary solitary bit of it. You sort of say, mm -hmm. well, yeah, I think this is pretty much what they're saying. And, uh, and you move on. Right, to a Plus, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful uh, correlation that the, the technology, the triple technology, says find the core. Exactly. Don't worry about the adverbs. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> so, I think that's right. I think that's exactly right. And you and you manipulate that. You run with those. You run so, those ideas. so treatment, for example, is, uh, do you do you think about this as a uh, part of uh, profession? Uh, well, actually, we we, we actually define it more as the uh, you know as the mechanism. So either the drug or the procedure right. treats. You so could you have occupational activity and then healthcare activity. Actually, in modern medicine, right, mm -hmm. it's going to be the prevention and it will be the part of. Uh, Oh yes, no, 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 no. Well, oh yeah, that's that's true. I mean, that's, but, that, but that's like a, that's like an inference. What actually? Right. What, no, no, no. What I, actually I, I prevents? Yeah, yeah. But well, you can bring it in. That you're right. But we do have prevents as well. For you yeah. Need to have a, a more complex. Oh yeah. Uh, situation where you want to bring broaden it up to to the future. Of this. Oh, yeah. well, I think so. And the point is, this is what I talk about the incremental yeah. development. I think that is this is the that you do. So I just want to say, I mean, I, I need to move on and say, but, but we have we have done um, uh, various uh, evaluations, um, either focused on you know on biomedical subdomain or on structure, and they all seem to come out now roughly about about 75% uh, precision. That is, if we give you a triple, what's the chance that it's I mean, that's what the text actually said, not whether it's God's truth, but did the person actually assert that? And it's roughly around 75%. Recall. Well, 60%, but this by recall means, is this a predication that SEMREP would get, not everything that was asserted in the text? So it's, it's, it's usable, I would say. It's far from perfect. 
Uh, I'm just, I just wanted to say this just to give you an idea of this, the domains that we've extended to, and we get usually about the same result. So we started with... May I ask one yeah? very brief question? Yeah. You say 75% recall of individual... No, pre precision. 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 precision recall, okay. What I was interested in, if you would look at repetition, and if you would look at unique statements, you know, oh, I think they'd be much yeah. higher. Exactly. Much higher. Yeah, exactly. exactly. And that's what we're interested yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. Yeah. We so. have actually done that with, <laughs> with some of our literature-based discovery work. We said we looked at it by hand and said, okay, oh, I mean, this assertion, you know, X interacts with B, <clears throat> is at least one of them right? Yeah. And so therefore, yeah, well, that would be much higher. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it would be 85 or 90. Yeah, right. Right. Okay. yeah exactly. That, that is right. So this was the most, this was the most stringent evaluation. Yeah. Every one of them had to be right. So we, we moved on. I said health promotion, um, uh, influenza epidemic preparedness, which was no longer medicine, but basically information exchanged by government agencies, health promotion, programs for healthy living, stop smoking, lose weight, climate and health, um, uh, there's the health effects of, 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 of climate change, climate and information management, actually running this on NLP, papers about NLP, so that the concepts are now our, 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 our predications and information retrieval. This sort of thing. We're presenting, we're going to submit it to any of those things that would be acceptable. It works just about, just about as well. And uh, so, uh, so I just want to say briefly, this is essentially I've had over the years several people, but about right now, this is the team that's working on it. It's very small numbers, but very, very knowledgeable, very knowledgeable people. We have a mixture of MDs, PhDs, and linguistics, computer science. Um, so I don't know. If we have time, I can give a 10-minute demo, or to the should I do that? Yeah, yeah. While you start us up, one question. If you would take the entire subset, the, the entire set you have, and you would create a subset with the provenance minimally asserted once in that line, that's, that's my previous question. Mm -hmm. You would probably have a set right now, even if you are restricting yourself to a subset of semantic types and everything, mm -hmm. we would have probably 80% of what has ever been said in that line. <laughs> probably, yeah, we, could, yeah. we could probably do it. Yes, we, it's so amazing what that would be one thing to do. Yeah. Let's create one yeah. out of set yeah. that says these are all the assertions that have done you done minimally once in that. Yeah. Yeah. No, it no. would be much higher than sixty five percent. Oh yeah. So much, much that could be created in, in half a day yeah. because you have all the problems of public yeah. ID yeah. and yeah. position. Yeah. Absolutely. Let's do it. Yeah. Oh okay. gosh. Absolutely. It's not take too long. <laughs> 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 you can still do it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm going to show you here is the as this, is this is one application that we have used to exploit <clears throat> exploit the uh, the predications and I'm going to exemplify it with with the clock genes. So something I'm hoping that it, I actually I gave this talk at, at, on NIH campus not too long ago and I said well I said I'm sure there won't be a you know a, a chronobiologist in the audience. <laughs> 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 but he didn't criticize me on it so. <laughs> So, well, we, so we, yeah, this first page is, is just PubMed. And this is the information retrieval. I mean, you don't have to really know anything. You say, oh, I know the clock genes. You don't have to know whether it's that the generic term. Is there a gene called clock? You don't really care. You just do that search. And we limit it. Say so we start here, we, so we have publications with, I don't know if we have any really from, from 1900, but their Medline has a few going back. But it, it, we have all, whatever is there. And ending, we, we, we process it offline <clears throat> uh, because of, because I myself and in our group, we just don't have the machinery to do it on the fly. Could be done with with enough money, but so we keep it up to date. You see, we see within usually about a month, a month or so. So we get the thousand most recent uh, predications. We go to now the summarization page. I don't have enough time to really talk about this, but there's several things that we see here. Well, first of all, it tells us what our search was, you know, what the, what the dates were, and uh, you know how many predications we got. So we got six thousand. I mean, so we were saying, but. Overall, five, six, five to twelve per 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 citation is about is usually what about we get. Now, with the summarization, I didn't point out that not only do we we, we uh, pick a topic, but we can kind of pick a point of view. So many things have been like, and especially within the medical field, you want to talk about is this a disease? You want to talk about its treatment, its etiology, the underlying molecular biology, this sort of thing. So we could look at the tobacco gene. You don't get very much on the treatment, but. Uh, but, you know, really, this is really more, we want to look at the pharmacogenomics. <clears throat> so when we, we pick that, 
And then it gives us topics that we can pick. And what these are is just taking all the arguments, either subject or the predications, and, and, and sorting them and saying, this is what, what you're going to get. So I want to take clock. And then there's more relations. It's going to, do you want the executive summary? Do you want to boil it down or do you want to broaden it up? And for now, I'll just say I'm going to, I'm going to take the executive summary. I, I click summarize here. I see I got about 942, which we'll see is, uh, is quite a bit, actually. You get to the graph, and this graph is, we're working on actually statistical methods for making a graph like this more readable. What I'll do first is show, okay, what the graph has, it's a representation of the predications. All the nodes are concepts, the arcs are arguments. You can, here's a, here's a, 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 a list telling you what the, what the predic predicates are, and you can turn some of them off. I'm going to turn off location of, interaction of, and part of for genes because where they're located is kind of a different story from what they do. I mean, that's, it's another story. So here we get, here we get a graph, and we can see various things of just kind of, I mean, it's a summary, too. And there's a summary, in mean, automatic summarization theory, as it were, they talk about two things, two aspects of a summary, the informative aspect, what you get just from the summary, and sort of the indicative aspect, where the summary might point, send you to more information. So in the informative aspect of this graph, and it's really, there's too much here for us to go into it all, but we can see various things. Now the concepts are, are color-coded according to ULMS semantic groups, and this is, this is in the documentation. So we can, I'll just point out some of them here, this kind of mauve is our dise diseases, disorders. So we see obesity, breast carcinoma, dyslipidemias. The gray are processes, physiologic processes. <clears throat> we see aging. Uh, homeostasis. Uh, uh, what I get? Uh, well, I suppose I go along. Uh, here we see this darker colored gray is genes. So we see if we want what we can see here. Then we can put out one more. Is that there's the yellow? It doesn't show up too good on the screen here. Which are substances? So where did I see my enzymes here? Well, what I can do by just glancing at this without looking at anything more, I can see that, um, and if I look around, I can see what the important clock genes are. So here's this, this DAC1, I mean, this, these are really, these are the crucial clock genes. This ARNTL, PR1, uh, 2, 3, SLC, what did I see, one of the CRI for cryptochromosome and cryptochrome something. So you, you see, okay, these are the important clock genes. I also see, I see several um, things that they affect. I mean, I see aging, obesity, breast carcinoma, growth, dyslipidemia. So I know something, metabolism. I know something about them before I even sort of started. And as it turns out, I did, I mean, I did, I'm of course not a chromobiologist, I'm a linguist actually, but I, using this in Medline, I went in and looked carefully in Medline about the, the history of the clock genes. And, the issue is there was a discovered in, in 1970, I think, 71, 70, 71, in, in fruit flies, which many of us know, and they were subsequently found to occur in not only humans, but all living cells. <clears throat> and they were initially thought to only affect circadian aspects, I mean, putting you to sleep, waking you up, which is why they're called clock gene. But in about 2004 or 2005, and you can see it in Medline, Research and this was this was earlier was all sort of basically molecular biology research. What 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 chemicals and what substances do they interact with? It was determined that um, not only do they wake you up and put you to sleep, but that this is crucially involved with metabolism. First of all, not in metabolism, but also disease. I mean that they're crucially involved with several, as we can see already here. Just again, important diseases, and there's subsequently this basic basic research from fruit flies. In you know, in the, a matter of, of, of 40, 50 years, is having serious clinical clinical implications, and we will actually see some of that in in this graph. So the first thing I want to point out is that um, now, of course, I mean, if you just opened this yourself, you wouldn't know exactly which one to look at, but it's it's limited by quite a bit. So I looked at here. I say clock in this green. They say effects homeostasis. I pull up the citation. <clears throat> And we see here that uh, a non-circadian role for clock genes in sleep homeostasis, a strain comparison. Now, sometimes because of formatting, we don't get the date. Let's see. We can go directly to PubMed and see where this is. So 2007, this is what I was saying. This is when this kind of information was beginning to be, beginning to be realized. 
And uh, so uh, the, the important thing is to say here is that um, also play, uh, so high levels of expression may never, so this is, I guess it says it negatively impact recovery sleep, so it does talk about sleep, but it is, it is also talking about, um, uh, where did I see this was, uh, was metabolism. <clears throat> so, well, at least the, I mean, I guess it's going to hard for me to find this in here again the second time. Um, uh, so I guess you'll have, I guess you'll have the trouble. When I say the non-circadian role here is, um, is actually metabolism. So the, the next thing we can look at is we can see that here we're saying the clock genes are, this is associated with this color, associated with obesity, which it seems to be rather a surprising, a surprising kind of thing, which I think is not too, well. here's one about, I want to look at this one here. This is about, actually, uh, this is about more about alcoholism, but this next one, <clears throat> I mean, the crucial thing from just a couple years ago, which is, which is crucial, is that, uh, is that we see obesity alters circadian expression from molecular clock genes in the brain stem. So, this is, yeah, yeah, there's, there's a, a strong relationship. So interaction between the two, and I think up until a few years ago, I mean, this was totally not known. Right. And I wanted to point out something crucial here that we notice here, some of the genes they're looking at, this PER1 and PER2, are important in that what we can see from this is that there's essentially a discovery lurking right in this very page, which people haven't actually, I haven't actually seen it. But, I mean, maybe it is in that way, but the fact that you know, there's been a long term, long time, sort of informal medical association between obesity and cancer. The first publication that I find in Medline is in 1947, and they refer to a paper from 1936 or something, which I couldn't find in Medline, but they, you know, they, they, were, they, were, they, uh, they took mice, I forget whether they've got cancer normally or whether they got obese normally, but they took the two of them and they compared them, and those that were, I think, artificially I guess uh, where they got, they artificially uh, developed, um, by giving some developed uh, neoplasms, so they made half of that group obese and the other half they left, and the ones that were made obese developed a neoplasm much more quickly. But there's no sort of mechanism known for, for, known for that, but I believe it is the clock genes, and I believe we can see it here, because one thing we see, remember this, here I said that we're saying the, the obesity alters, and we see tier one, tier two. Now notice that we see here we have um, where is it? Is it down here? Yeah, here we have so here's a oops we have peer I think it's called peer for period I guess uh, here is peer two and glioma and so this says now remember that obesity can mess up peer one and peer two now here <coughs> this says deregulated expression of peer one and two in human gliomas so. It seems to me there is the clock genes, obesity and cancer, they provide a mechanistic explanation of why obesity is associated with cancer. One thing to point out, just to complicate things further, this happens all the time in the brain. They spell the gene as a mouse gene and they mean the human They mean the human, yes, that's that is part of never going to be solved by computer. Yeah, that's very <laughs> well actually no but uh, Mary, they may they may in fact mean the mouse though in this. This may be this is probably yeah, basic research. Oh, they say the human gliomas, you know. So oh, I see. Yeah. <laughs> so they actually look at the mouse gene, but they talk about human gliomas. The computer gets completely crazy about that. And yeah, this you're is why right. Always. That's why I love. You're 100 percent right. They don't they, even they yeah, don't even say mouse. They don't even say mice in this. Yeah. In this. That's and right. Exactly. Yeah. So, but they spell yeah. it as the mouse gene. Yes, it happens all right. the time. Yeah. And people say <clears throat> BRCA1 causes breast cancer, but of course. Philosophically, the, the gene doesn't cause breast cancer. It's yeah. a truncated protein and blah, blah, blah. Right, right, so right, 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 right. These, this is why we will always need this predict this projection of the triple back into the text. is great right. because that is what I want to read. Yes, you have to read exactly the right. Yeah. You have to see it. Another thing is what I, I pointed out. I should point out is that the first thing to do, and we always do it, to see is this is this is this predication right or wrong. We're well, seeing. I haven't really seen it. We get most of it right. I want to end with one thing, sort of another discovery, sort of thing. When you see here in this, the clock genes affect aging. Another thing that is only very recently. I mean, you know, just a couple of years ago, um, seeing that this particular clock gene, uh, age-related circadian dysfunction, 
I mean, this whole notion of you don't sleep well when you get older and all this other stuff, it is all, everything, this is a this is a sort of a, a plug for systems medicine and systems biology. It's all related in things that we really hadn't thought about. Obesity adds to sleep disorders. Sleep disorders, not sleeping enough, <coughs> contributes to obesity. <coughs> obesity contributes to aging. And what you're missing there is exercise. Yeah. That actually yes. Changes the expression. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. really beautiful. Yeah. We put fit beautifully into your exactly. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. I, I, I probably is actually it's probably also in here if I were to. Yeah. Uh, make sure <laughs> it probably is. So I think that's basically where I'll stop. But I mean, I, I hope you can see that this this is kind of like the an enabling technology. I think for what Baron is is talking about, and, and I totally agree that it's my notion that this is a tool to make you smarter. And get on top of the tsunami of information. It turns an information base into a knowledge base. And that's right. Yeah. Do some of the current vernacular. Yeah, exactly. Have you thought about trying to uh, crowdsource the more problematic or more likely errors? Yeah, Barrett has just been talking exactly. about that. So, what, what we really want to do is do 90% by computer. Uh, there is a student out of my control that came from Zurich who wants to work with Mark Musing in Stanford to do exactly that and say my medline and those things that have in red that you're not sure about it with find the author say did you mean this subject predicate object drag in boxes make it very simple add the provenance automatically done and don't spend I will spend any PhD time on the last 10% because it will you will never solve pair of two and the computer said, ah, they're actually meeting the mm -hmm. <laughs> Forget it. And it's another concept in your blessed. Mm -hmm. The mouse gene yeah, and the yeah. human gene. But Do they need a protein or a gene? <coughs> you get yeah, down to one or percent. That's right. All that's of a sudden right. it's humanly possible. That's yeah. right. Whereas the, you're overwhelmed by uh, the total job. That's and right. especially that's if right. you that's say right. to people, right. if you identify the triples in your abstract better, you'll get citations on this. Well, but also yeah, you can the reward structure structure has to be so that's the reward. Has to be Think of the power, though, of like the astronomy project where they where they had people categorizing, you know, objects that they saw as various types of yeah. galaxies or whatever. But but this is a volunteer database of people who might actually recognize some liquid cancer okay. that isn't known. You draw tons of people in. You wouldn't yeah. even have to pay the author to, or find the author. Yeah. Exactly. No, I think it's definitely the two need to be yes. put together. Absolutely. So I decided to show one. But it's a 30 second movie, so I won't take any of your time. But exactly as Tom now said, if we combine our strengths and we would take the time out of the thing, what we do, if you look at these, this, this NOLA test, it's all the triples about one gene, so we have two million of them, and now we just look at loose associations over time. We do multi dimensional scaling of 25,000 genes, so we don't look at real connections, but also at associations. And this is a movie I made spontaneously with a Chinese guy at Karolinska Institute who work, worked with Hans Rosling, the guy who went to Google, and they use this Google thing now for showing trends. And we entered fake data, I have to say, but this could be done very easily with Medline. So we put the timeline, and Herman, one of my students, is now actually making an MDS of Medline year after year after year after year for certain semantic times like genes. And this would come out. Uh, and funnily enough, when I showed these total fake data to my head of department, who was a big geneticist, Gert Jan van Oren, he said, oh, that's not how it went. No, yes. these are fake data. <laughs> but we can film these kind of movies. Uh -huh. And what we want to do now is click five concepts and show how they behaved over time until even people saw it. So this is the movie uh, that if you go back to, uh, to the very beginning of time uh, that uh, people started to publish your men like here, and let's say we started 1990. This is happening, and the center is uh, cystic fibrosis, is the gene, the, the, sorry, the disease. And you see how genes are moving <coughs> closer to that disease over time. And at some point, as you see there, Ela in 1990 was a crazy guy that said these two genes are connected, you know, at some time in, in, in history. So this guy appeared to be, obviously, uh, Baradon, who was crazy, and he was wrong. <laughs> So what you will see after is that these genes really move apart again because they are co-mentioned with many other things. So you can even see trends that were not consistent and uh, move away from each other until, so, and then you see that even after they have been moving together for years, even people have the idea that the CFTR gene, which is now the core gene, uh, and we have more than 1,500 mutations in it, 
cause existing fibrosis was moving closer and closer to the phenotype. So we can create, once we have done MEDLINE year after year after year, and do a <coughs> complete pre-MDS multidimensional scaling of how all these concepts were positioned towards each other in that year, now we can show the trends, and you can show the two genes are consistently moving together, you extrapolate, and we can show that we could predict most major findings in MEDLINE years before people thought about it. What's the similarity in the text that you use? Sorry? Oh, this is, so, it's, so let's assume you have uh, a conceptual overlap, so we express these nodes that we make for every gene and protein as vectors. You have obviously you inner, inner in product, 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 for example, of their conceptual overlap, and then they have a distance. Now, MDS is working yeah, like this, if you know MDS. So it's not metric or metric? Sorry? Metric or non-metric? Uh, non-metric, this one. But if you look at the MDS in general, just for the people that don't know it, if you would have a table that shows all the, 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 uh, the distances between all the cities in the US, the real distances, and you would ask MDS to, make, to place that in a two-dimensional space, it would be the perfect map of the US, so to say. Now if you take the time of that it takes to get there by car, you know, the thing doesn't work anymore. Well, so there is a tension in the if you if you use airline the train prices. Yeah. If you lose airline exactly. prices, you're gonna get that. But this already work. goes wrong with three. So if uh, two th three genes have one have a distance of two of, of one hundred, two and sixty, that's not Pythagoras. Is, is distance here a number of tools that relate here. them? Yeah, well or their conceptual overlap that you can pr uh, make a number out of that. But the thing is, there is tension in the network. So let alone if you do that for 25,000 genes. And what MDS does, it takes all the real distances in multidimensional space and it projects it with the least possible tension into two dimensions. That's what is this thing. So if you pre-calculate all these MDS things for all semantic types every year, and you store that as nanopublications, now you can create this movie on the spot for any five genes you capture in any text and say, show me how they behaved over the last 10 years in Medline. I'm thinking about policy This is genetic stuff. Which is yeah, yeah, yeah. Now you can exactly predict the merger of companies yeah. as well. But also, this is, uh, you know, follow trends in policy making and, and provide new ideas about where policy is going. And you will see that people have predicted something years ago or like that are now right because that policy occurs because of certain things. So, so speaking of policy, since the subject has come up again, Tom, I seem to recall you telling me that you thought your system could be run against NIH Reporter as well as against Medline. Yeah. Right? I mean, you know, we, we did, the, yeah, we processed, uh, well, uh, NIH, you mean the, 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 yeah, the NIH Reporter? I, yes, I mean, we would, we would not get all you know the kind of the social things in there. In there, um, you know, there sometimes it says, oh, you know, there's a meeting in building one, and for, you know, fight obesity and this sort of thing. But you say, you know, what, in the bad parts, it says such and such a researcher in, in, in this institute discovered such and has now been given tenure. Yeah, we would get those. Well, well, but, but if you just looked at the abstracts of, of, of funded proposals, yeah. Oh, yeah. Abstract of funded oh, yeah. proposals, oh, yeah. I mean, sort of like abstracts yeah. of uh, published. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, I can actually, you know, it kind of sets me up. We, you know, we, I can show you, we have, we're have we working right now actually with the NIH, uh, with the, the Office of the Director to um, to do all the grants that have been that have been submitted since since 2007, I think. But what we have right now, I can show you in the we have we, we have the ones from from 2007 only. But actually, let me show you. And this is for, for it's a portfolio analysis kind of thing. In, oh yeah, I guess so. That um, with the clock genes. So as I said, the research changed quite a bit in 2000, right around, I mean, after 2007. But let's take a look at um, the grants which we have, which were submitted in uh, 2007, and look at the clock genes. And we can. Oops. So this is information out of reporter. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> so um, let me see. Um, so that's right. So we processed we processed the grants, the grant applications, uh, the abstracts, titles, abstracts, and specific aims, and um, ran them through uh, ran them through uh, 
SEMED, and we get essentially the same result. The, the search engine now is not PubMed, it's, a, it's actually a more sophisticated uh, statistics based, so it gives you actually relevant, relevant rankings. But let's see, let me do it here. Um, So what I got, so what we have here is a graph, I mean it has the same characteristics as what I showed you the semantic medline, and we can look at its informative aspect, I mean I won't go into this all, but if we basically look at this list of concepts here, you'll notice we don't see, remember I said there was more basic molecular biology research, interaction of substances, not diseases and physiologic functions, we don't really see, um, well, we see sleep, which would be expected because of the, that type of thing about it. But we see well, myopia for one or, or, or another. Um, but and sleep disorders, but there's no cancer, there's no, uh, there's no dyslipidemias and whatnot. Um, except that, very interestingly, we see up here, uh, we see in this you know, bright red, because that's for causes, we see clock, uh, it says causes diabetes. So the point is, this is actually. We look at the grant, we look at the application, and this is actually one of the first papers, one of the first research supported by NIH that said, you know, and they say here, we can read it, we have made the exciting discovery that a mutation in the first circadian clock gene to be discovered in mammals, clock, not only alters circadian and sleep phenotypes, but also leads to obesity and diabetes. So, in selling this to, I say, well, now, if your portfolio analysts that have 